Hello and welcome to this tutorial on psychological assessment. So this tutorial is adapted from the second part of chapter 4 in Mastering the Clinical Conversation, Language as Intervention. You can find other resources on the clinical applications of RFT at languageasintervention.com. In this tutorial, you will learn about assessing coherence. So first, let's remember what we are assessing in therapy based on RFT. Given that the main goals of therapy are to shape flexible context sensitivity and functional coherence, what we want to assess is the client's context sensitivity, or how he notices and responds to the various elements of the context, and coherence, or how he makes sense of the different elements of his experience, including the different elements of the context and his actions. The general approach to assessing coherence consists of exploring how the client builds symbolic networks to integrate the different elements of his experience. In simpler terms, we are interested in how the client conceptualizes the events of his life, in the kinds of stories he tells, and whether these ideas, concepts, and beliefs are useful to build a meaningful life. We also want to explore to what extent functional, essential, and social coherence are influencing the way the client builds symbolic networks. In the area of self, for example, building a sense of self as a context of all psychological experiences is useful or functionally coherent because it helps find stability and flexibility. In the area of meaning and motivation, conceptualizing actions as part of a hierarchical network with values at the top is useful or functionally coherent because it helps find intrinsic and lasting satisfaction in a variety of actions. And conceptualizing experiences as antecedents, behaviors, and consequences is useful or functionally coherent to track the effectiveness of our choices. When we will explore interventions in detail in next tutorials, we will see what kinds of conceptualizations are most useful in different areas. For now, we will simply focus on relational flexibility and fluency and on rules and rule following. Assessing relational fluency and flexibility consists of exploring if the client is able to derive different kinds of symbolic relations in relevant contexts. Most adult humans with language that we see in psychotherapy are quite fluent in any kind of relational framing. They are able to derive relations of opposition if the therapist asks a question including instead of, to derive a relation of comparison if the therapist asks a question including more than, and so on with all kinds of relational framing. However, in some contexts, clients can struggle to derive certain relations and thus access the useful transformation of function. For example, it's not rare to see clients having difficulties with taking the perspective of somebody they are in conflict with or to project themselves in the future if they are depressed. In a first session with a client and then throughout therapy, it's useful to pay attention to the way the client responds to contextual cues evoking relational framing and see in what areas the client might be struggling. Consider asking questions or making statements of all kinds, but of course relevant to your conversation with the client, which can evoke different kinds of relational framing and observe if this leads to the transformation of function that you would expect from deriving the appropriate relation. For example, if you ask the client to take the perspective of someone they are in conflict with, you would expect them to tell a different story. If you ask the client about the consequence of an action, you would expect them to talk about what happens after this action. The flexibility of relational framing is assessed through the client's ability to change the way he conceptualizes his experiences, even if it's only for the purpose of exploring different interpretations and hypotheses. For example, simply asking if there might be another explanation for an event that what the client is currently believing can be a way of testing his relational flexibility. Generally speaking, it is useful to pay attention to the ability of the client to elaborate different conceptualizations of the same experiences. Or said simply, is the client rather flexible or rigid? Assessing rules and rule following consists of exploring how the client conceptualizes the contingencies influencing his behavior and how he responds to these conceptualizations. Often, rules are spontaneously expressed by clients in an explicit fashion, 
For example, by saying, I can tell my husband how I'm feeling or he will get mad at me. This statement describes a behavior, talking about feelings with the husband, and a consequence, a bad reaction from the husband. When rules are not spontaneously expressed, it is possible to unveil them by asking the client to describe thoughts that occur before, during, and after an action. For example, you might, you might ask a client, what were you thinking before you left the room? To which the client might answer that I couldn't take it anymore. Such response indicates a rule, even if it's not explicitly stated yet, because the client implies that staying in the room would have had bad consequences. In order to make the rule more explicit, you might ask more about the expected consequence by asking, for example, what did you think would have happened if you had stayed in the room? Or what were you hoping to escape by leaving the room? Which would lead the client to state the expected consequences of staying in the room and leaving the room. Then we need to explore how the client responds to the rule. That is, if he is following the rule and for what reason. There are four main kinds of rule following that typically lead, lead to psychological problems. Pliance, inapplicable tracking, inaccurate tracking, and tracking leading to adaptive peaks. We saw before in previous tutorials that pliance, which is driven by social coherence, is when following a rule is socially reinforced because there is a correspondence between the action stated by the rule and the action actually performed. A typical cue indicating pliance is when a client talks about what they must or should do without stating any consequence. For example, a client might simply say, I should get a job. In this case, it seems that the only thing that matters is to comply with the rule, regardless of the experience consequence. Thus, a good way of assessing if this is a case of pliance is to ask the client about the consequence of following the rule by saying, for example, what would happen if you didn't get a job? Or simply, why should you get a job? If this is a case of pliance, the client will often struggle to identify a consequence or reason. In other cases, a client might state a consequence by saying, for example, I should get a job to be more independent. However, what reinforces rule following is not to be more independent, but social approval for following the rule per se, such as parents getting angry at the client if he didn't get a job. In this case, it's possible to identify clients by virtually removing the influence of social approval and see if the client's behavior would change. For example, the therapist might ask, if your parents were okay with you not getting a job, would you still think you should get a job? So clients don't always know how to answer these kinds of questions because often they have never thought about these issues in this way. Difficulties to answer such questions are often the sign that clients might be involved because it generally means the client is not tracking the correspondence between the consequence stated by the rule and the experience consequence. Concretely, in our example, if the client is not able to say that he still wants to be independent, even if his parents didn't mind him not getting a job, it's likely that he's following the rule just to comply with the rule and be in line with his parents' expectations. As we saw before, tracking is when following a rule is reinforced by the consequence stated by the rule. In other terms, there is a correspondence between the consequence stated by the rule and the experience consequence. There are at least three cases where tracking can lead to problems, and we can consider that in these cases, rule following is primarily driven by essential coherence. The first is inapplicable tracking. Inapplicable tracking is when a client states and tries to follow a rule that matches his experience, but the rule can't be followed. For example, the client says, I would be much happier if my wife worked less. The problem with this rule is that it doesn't say anything about the client's behavior. It only says what his wife needs to do. Therefore, this rule can't be followed by the client. Stating the rule is not so much a problem per se, though. The problem is when the client is influenced by the rule and tries to follow it, even though it is impossible. This is the kind of problem we see when clients ruminate about past events that can be changed. For example, a client might say, if only I didn't drive so fast, I, would have had, uh, I wouldn't have had this accident. Again, 
This rule might be experientially accurate, but the client can't follow it in practice. The only thing she can do is relive the events in her thoughts and act differently in this virtual reenactment. It might help her feel a little better for a short moment, but quickly she realizes that her life has not changed outside her thoughts. She still had the accident. So in order to assess whether inapplicable tracking is involved, the therapist can ask the client about the action he or she can concretely take based on the stated rule. For example, if the client says, if only I could go back in time and make a different choice, the therapist can ask, what is the next step you can take then? Or if the client states a rule about other people's behaviors, like people should be more respectful of each other, the therapist can test the applicability of this rule to the client's behavior, for example, by asking, is this a rule for you to follow or is it one for others to follow? Tracking can also lead to problems if, if the rule doesn't describe contingencies accurately or completely enough to guide effective actions. For example, a client might attend only to short-term consequences when saying, I need to drink alcohol to feel better. This rule may be accurate if we take into account only short-term effects of drinking alcohol, but if the client drinks important amounts of alcohol, then his health is probably negatively impacted in the long run, and the client probably doesn't feel better in the end. In order to assess inaccurate tracking, we can ask questions orienting the client to contingencies that might be missed. For example, if a client says, I have to prove that I'm right in order to be respected by others, the therapist could ask, in your experience, is this what happens when you prove that you are right? So the client may or may not identify other contingencies at this point, but as more work is done to shape flexible context sensitivity, rules will generally be formulated to include new aspects of the client's experience. Note that the point here is not to prove to the client that he is wrong, but to help him take into account aspects of his own experience that might be missed. The therapist doesn't tell the client that his rule is inaccurate, he simply encourages him to test the correspondence between the consequence stated by the rule and the experience consequence. So we are still putting the client's experience at the center of our attention, but we encourage the client to observe this experience more carefully if needed. The last kind of tracking leading to problems is tracking leading to adaptive peaks. In this form of tracking, the rule points to a consequence that the client desires, and so it makes sense for him to follow this rule. However, this desirable consequence can hide other sources of reinforcement that might be more beneficial to the client. For example, a client might say, I want to stay in this marriage because it brings me financial security. By following this rule, the client might indeed reach security and comforts, but if there are aspects of her life that are not satisfying or even problematic because she stays in this marriage, as it can be the case in an abusive relationship, for example, perhaps financial security is an adaptive peak. In order to assess tracking leading to adaptive peaks, we can ask questions that orient the client to potential sources of reinforcement that might be currently missed. For example, to a client saying, I prefer staying on my own instead of being in a relationship. This way, I can keep my independence. The therapist could ask, are there things you miss from not being in a relationship? If the client identifies significant losses, it might be a sign that following the rule is an instance of tracking leading to adaptive peaks. Sometimes, the client can't identify these losses precisely because the adaptive peak hides them. So further exploration of the client's sources of satisfaction and dissatisfaction will then be needed to determine if tracking leading to adaptive peaks is involved. Let's finish this section on assessing coherence by talking about monitoring improvement. If flexibility and fluency of relational framing increases, you should see clients become able to adopt different perspectives entertain thoughts that, uh, they are not necessary, that they are not necessarily believing, reconsider their views on different topics, or simply show curiosity for new ideas and ways of thinking. 
improvement in rules and rule following should be reflected by an increase of accurate and effective tracking over inaccurate tracking, inapplicable tracking, tracking leading to adaptive peaks and pliance, except in some cases that we will explore further later. Concretely, clients should pay more attention to the consequences of following rules and more specifically to the correspondence between the consequences stated by the rules and the experience consequences. More generally speaking, we expect the client's language to be driven by functional coherence over social and essential coherence. For example, in the area of self, relating to thoughts through hierarchical and dialectic framing is a sign of greater stability and flexi flexibility in the sense of self. In the area of life meaning and motivation, connecting actions to values through hierarchical framing indicates that overarching and intrinsic reinforcement influences the client's actions. More, spe more specific cues of improvement will be covered as we explore the different areas of interventions based on RFT later. Here is a summary of the main points you've learned in this tutorial and that I encourage you to remember. Assessing coherence consists of exploring how the client builds symbolic networks to integrate the different elements of his experience. We can assess relational fluency and flexibility, which consists of exploring if the client is able to derive different kinds of symbolic relations in, re in relevant contexts. We can assess rules and rule following by testing for pliance, in inapplicable tracking, inaccurate tracking, and tracking leading to adaptive peaks. Improvement in coherence is reflected by higher fluency and flexibility in relational framing, by more accurate and effective tracking, and more generally by greater functional coherence over social and essential coherence. This is the end of this tutorial on assessing coherence in psychological assessment. This tutorial was adapted from the second part of chapter 4 in Mastering the Clinical Conversation, Language as Intervention. If you want to watch the next tutorial on activating behavior change focused on increasing functional contextual awareness, you can go to languageasintervention.com. You will also find other resources on the applications of RFT for clinical practice.